right. Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to have you here at CAM. And um, I'm delighted to have Bruce Lindsay and Brad Clofa with us tonight. And this happy occasion is here because Brad ha has published a fantastic book through Greg Miller Publishers, and it's being distributed by Kuntz. And I owe, I owe you, him a lot for that, actually. If you have any um, small rodents in your house that you want to take care of, this is a device for it, because it weighs close to seven pounds. Yeah. And, uh, we market it as a doorstop and a you know, plant presser. Yeah, I, feel, I feel so fortunate that St. Louis and Cam has a presence in such a fantastic book, which will be distributed worldwide. And, you know, we were very lucky to get Brad when we did because there's no way we could afford him today, <laughs> nor would he accept our offer. But we were so blessed in that we picked him at the right time to do this project. And at the time, Brad had done Wyden Kennedy, but really hadn't done that much in terms of a freestanding building. And so the, um, the board of directors then invited some heavy hitters, some museum makers to come to St. Louis to give talks, and at the time, uh, unlike we are today, they didn't have much money, so that's a joke. So, so what they did was, usually you would invite architects, and then you would have them give you proposals on what they wanted to do, then the, the people would pick. Well, since they didn't have money to do that, they invited the architects, people like Rem Coolhouse, Herzog de Muron, Brad Clofield, to come to simply talk about the projects that they have done in the past and to present it at Washington University. And so it was a great series of lectures that they did. And from those discussions, Brad was the guy that they chose. And they chose him, I think, because of the talent and the energy and, and the exuberance, but also because they could tell that he really wanted it. He, he's the one who really wanted the most. He stuck around the ground. He, he, he just felt like the type of artist that we would be showing today, which is someone who showed a lot of promise but really wasn't given that much opportunity. So they picked Brad on that. And I think the board of directors back then were dead on in choosing the right architect because since this project, Brad has gone on to do many, many great things, which I will say in my introduction. And I will introduce uh, Bruce Lindsay. And Bruce um, is a Dean of College of Architecture and Graduate School of Architecture and Urban Design, as well as the E. Desmond Lee Professor for Community Collaboration in the Arts at the Washington University in St. Louis. He is a native of Idaho, and Bruce received a bachelor's degree in art in 1976, which I didn't know until today. Uh, Google is wonderful. <laughs> and a master's degree in sculpture and photography in 1979, both from the University of Utah. He earned a master's degree in architecture from Yale University in 1986, and the following year joined the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. From 1994 to 2001, he served as associate head of Car Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture as associate professor of art and architecture. As a practicing architect, Bruce has worked with Gene Gannon Architects Design, the Pittsburgh Glass Center, which earned a gold rating under the U.S. Green Building Council's LEED guidelines. The project also received a Design Honor Award from the American Institute of Architects and was chosen as one of 2005's top 10 green buildings by the AIA's Committee on the Environment. Bruce has long focused on applying digital tools to design and construction practice. In 1992, his work in digital-aided manufacturing was cited by Engineering News Record as one of the year's 10 most significant contributions to the construction industry. His book, Digital Gary, Material Resistance, Digital Construction, which explores the use of technology and the design process of architect Frank Gary, has been translated into Italian and Chinese. Some of his honors include a 1993 Young Architects Award from Progressive Architecture and a 2002 AIA Design Merit Award for his extensive renovation with Edge Architecture of Society for Contemporary Craft in Pittsburgh. And before coming to St. Louis, Bruce was the Paul Rudolph Professor of Architecture at Auburn University in Auburn, Alabama. So we're delighted to have him here tonight. And Brad Clofield sitting right here next to me. And Brad is the founding principal of Allied Works Architecture, who designed and built the building that you're in right now. Brad studied architecture at the University of Oregon and went on to earn an advanced degree from Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture. 
After more than a decade of work and teaching in Los Angeles, New York, and Switzerland, Brad founded Allied Works Architecture in his native Portland in 1994. And in 2003, he added a New York office. Brad's earliest influences lay outside the field of architecture. While studying at the University of Oregon, he drew inspiration from the vast landscape and monumental works of civil engineering in the Pacific Northwest. While studying in, in New York, he was introduced to the simple yet profoundly resonant gestures of land and installation artists of that time. In 2000, Terence Riley, a leading architecture critic and former chief curator of architecture and design at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, identified Brad as an architect who is setting the pace for the future. In 2007, Metropolis's Andrew Blum noted Brad as being an elementalist in an architecture culture in which image is king, a leading American architect of new type, not a showman or a theorist, not a regionalist or a corporate architect, but a high art practitioner with burgeoning reputation for powerful, if subtle, buildings. In addition to building this museum, Brad and his team have worked on some of the most interesting and discussed structure, including the Berkeley Art Museum Pacific Film Archive, Booker T. Washington High School for the Performing, art, Performing and Visual Art, Musée National des Beaux-Arts of Quebec, Museum of Arts and Design, uh, Seattle Art Museum, uh, University, University of Michigan Museum of Art, and most recently, uh, Brad will be opening the Clifford Still Museum in Denver. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to sit and to discuss and to have a conversation with you two. It's great. It's wonderful to be here. Amazing to be back. I mean, a lot, a lot of emotions when uh, Paul was absolutely right. Um, I think I'd done two small gallery spaces in Portland for, for people I knew before this. Um, and and uh, to come down here, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, those of you that might know some of my other work, for some reason, I don't ever just get like a clean, simple site. You know, I come down here and there's this other building going up next door by this architect that some of you might know. <laughs> Right, and it's like, you know, what in the hell do you do with that, right? And, and I, think, I think that's why they hired me, because it was someone foolish and young enough that they might actually, might actually propose to do a concrete building next to that building, too. I mean, a lot of people ask, <clears throat> did you specifically choose concrete on your own, or was that asked of you? Oh, no, no, I chose it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll back up before, before that, too. It, it was interesting coming down here. Um, I had never been to St. Louis. In fact, I'd never been to the Midwest in any way, <laughs> actually. I'd only been to the coast. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, you, many of you in the room know what this neighborhood was like, whenever that was. Well, I think 1998 is when I came down. I think that's when the process started, 98 or 99. So you know what this neighborhood was like then. And it was awe-inspiring. It was... I mean, literally awe-inspiring. It's, it's, in the book, one of the, one of the premises of the book is I hired a, uh, an artist, a, a landscape photographer, to take photos of the landscapes of the projects because that's really the inspiration. And, and not necessarily landscape as in nature, but the sort of physical context. And the physical context of this building was so extraordinary, like no other city. I mean, it's, you know... I mean, for me, like no other city, and just, I mean, the kind of expanse of it and the, and the memory of the city that was now gone and, the, and this whole thing about mowing the empty lots that creates this kind of crazy urban prairie. And I mean, it was fascinating to me, absolutely fascinating. And that was the response. I mean, the, 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 the design response was to the possibility of unknown art, which we'll talk about, I would imagine, in a while, right? And then this, this kind of endless urban expanse that weaves between these, you know, almost all abandoned buildings at that time. I mean, so people can picture what you were seeing at the time. Was the Pulitzer built already? No, it was under no. construction. Yeah. No. One of my favorite quotes of Richard Serra is, um, work comes from work. And, and you said something amazing That's in your great. book, which work uh, begins with a walk. Work begins <laughs> with a walk. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that's what it was. It's, it's interesting. I know, and this is, this is probably a little bit gossipy, but I, I heard this from Betsy, Betsy Millar, that Peter Zumtor came, was one of the finalists, who is an absolutely amazing architect. I think probably one of the best, if not the best, I, I would say, personally, um, practicing today. And he, he came down, and he walked the site, and he told the committee that he felt absolutely nothing for this place. 
And that's what Betsy had told me. And, I, and if you look, you know, and I, I may this, you know, now it's on film and I'll, you know, be sued or something, but, but if, if you look at his work and the kind of beauty that he gets to work in too, right? I mean, but I think that's, that's, that's the artifice of a lot of architecture too, right? I mean, this is, this is probably a third of the American cities. This is the landscape of American cities. And so to me, it was inspiring. Like what, you know, what do you possibly do that respects this, that respects it as a, as a, as a, as a prevalent urban landscape that'll be here for quite a while? I mean, it's actually interesting because of the boom of the last decade, much more happened than I ever thought would happen, right? Because then it was like, you know, I'd been there for quite a while. So, I was I mean, once, yeah, I was once chastised for romanticizing the uh, burned out houses and the beautiful solitary chimneys of rural Alabama. Uh, I was, uh, people had told me that I'd missed the actual story of the yeah, no. things that happened. Were you ever criticized for that uh, idea yeah. about? Not to my face. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'm sure it's, I mean, maybe it's a romanticism, but I, but I also think it's just an acknowledgement that that is the physical context, and it, it is quite beautiful, right? I mean, it, it does, does every sort of middle urban neighborhood have to be five-story faux traditional buildings with a Starbucks on the corner? I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's an interesting, you know, maybe having some of these transitional places. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying you couldn't do stuff with it. I'm not saying it can't be better, but also to not I mean, I think just to get people to look at it. I mean, that's what you see these photos. Vicky took, you know, there's only two or three in the book, but her portfolio of photos on St. Louis is unbelievable. Mm. Just gorgeous. Probably the best of all. Well, that and the desert in Oregon were the two places that she really, <laughs> she really connected. Sort of, yeah, but, it, but I, I, think, I think just allowing it, its force, or let, let's even go for it. So, you know, as an architect, you certainly, you're certainly charged with imagining a future. And in, the, and in this particular case, it was a future occupation by the art, right? And a kind of activity with the artists and the community and things like that. And so you're, 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 you're trying to concentrate the forces of a place in a way that, that inspires that kind of activity. But a lot of, I mean, it's, it's just a range of choices, I suppose. I mean, I think if you look at the Pulitzer, it's a very introverted building, right? I mean, it's an interesting contrast, both concrete buildings, back to that. But one was attempting to be a kind of open matrix, which maybe had a little too much natural light. <laughs> right, but, but was attempting to be a kind of open matrix, an almost transparent sense of boundary, which is a contradictory term, I suppose. You know, where one is really a chapel and very introverted and you know, absolutely gorgeous. But, but, but two different responses to place. And one would even question whether the Pulitzer was even responding to place. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it was. Yeah. I'm not sure that was the concern but, of the But your design of this space wasn't in re response to that, right? This was its it, own thing. The, the, the goal, the, what I took as the site of this building was from the wall of the Pulitzer to the street. And the transparency that was created was to say that that's really our domain. Mm -hmm. You know, we sort of stole the Sarah in that way, although now there's a wire up, I see, that <laughs> keeps us, you know, the riffraff from going over. That's right. <laughs> You also stole the corner, and you also gave windows to the site in a way that, for me, really makes the Pulitzer even stronger. But yeah, well, that was that was that was maybe the um, the aspirational urban intent was to try to establish a sense of boundary of the street again, and to not elevate the building on a plinth or separate it in any way. And we fought hard to get that window on the corner because it's a valuable wall space you know, for any gallery. But as, what, as you can see by this show. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, which we knew would happen sometimes too. But uh, what I always used to say is I want somebody who's like driving to the corner market to get their six pack of beer to look in here and go, what the hell is that? <laughs> right, they call that art? Yeah. You know, and then drive off to get your, yeah. you know, and if, if, if we get that, then you're like winning, you know, yeah. to make a kind of immediacy like that. And that absolutely did happen. Because when we do open that, those windows up, people do come in, especially at night, because we leave the lights on. People drive by, and you can clearly see it's, it's, you know, it's not a car dealership. It's not you know, some corner store. So people do come in the next day. It's like, what's, what's happening in there? And that's, that's really fascinating to me. What the hell? 
I once heard Merce Cunningham uh, talk, and he said something that I've not forgotten. He said, um, in relationship to modern dance, that uh, dance can be expressive without its need to uh, signify anything because of the way that we respond to a sense of shared embodiment. Hmm. And I've often thought of that in relationship to materials. Hmm. Certain materials have the sense, and I think you talk a little bit about the kind of physical presence of materials, but I've thought about that in terms hmm. of the concrete and the, and, the, and the stainless steel, which at times has a kind of sense of, ephemer of ephemerality, but also has a presence that I think is, is really beautiful mm -hmm. uh, without, its necessarily, without it necessarily meaning something or referring to something else. There's something that came up. The, the book is obviously with images of the work, but it's also structured around, I don't know, five, six, seven different conversations. Um, one with Anna Hamilton, one with Doug Aiken, Ben Rubens, three of them with artists, landscape architect, a theologian, uh, manufacturer, makers, m but all of sort of thinkers and makers, and something that comes up, and I, I was rereading them this afternoon, talking to all of the artists, actually, all three very different artists, the body comes up, and the relationship between body and architecture comes up, and body in their work. I mean, Anne Hamilton made this comment that, in reference to, to my work, that my work goes from the sort of infinite and the landscape in, which is exactly how I think about it, and her starts at the body and goes out, and it's the boundaries of those two practices where they meet. Yeah. And I thought that was a beautiful way. And then Doug Aiken talked about the body in the, in the same way, and the, and the, 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 the sort of lyricism, that's, that's too, but I think the way you were talking about it, there's a, there's a fluidity to certain architecture and a kind of openness to it that allows the body mm -hmm. a place rather than just an observer, or, or it allows a participation. You know, it's the difference between object buildings yeah. and I mean, all, all architecture has space, all architecture has the possibility of experience, but, but the, the conception of a lot of buildings is as, as an object, so that you perceive the object first, and then you proceed inside the body and have a, whatever the experience may be. I think in my work, and certainly in this building, it was an open matrix, you know, it's trying to blur the boundaries between the enclosure of a museum and the, and the openness of this particular mm -hmm. urban landscape. And then also part of the reason it was an open matrix because it was like, God knows what the hell would ever go in here. You know, right. there could be anything in here. You know, we could be sitting in a room with six feet of dirt right now. We, we have, you know, no idea. Hmm. I, I think what's really, and what I love about our building is that, you know, if, if you've traveled and visited other contemporary art museums, you'll reali realize that no other museum is like ours. In, in sense of openness and just the possibility. And we're, we're talking about the David Adjaye building in, in, in Denver, which is a, a really wonderful building, but they're so fixed in their idea of what a room is. And what I love about our space is that the sense of scale is really unfinished until a human being walks in. So when you see a painting or a sculpture, you're sort of unaware of the size, you know, how big it should be, and you, and you sort of know what a, a gallery space size is, or you sort of know what the painting size should be, but you're really unsure until a, you see someone walking in front of it, then you say, aha, that's the human scale. That's, you know, really and because it's so large and so vast and so flexible and so open, it's hard to tell how big a work is until a human walks in front of it. It's really interesting. That's, that's actually really interesting, because that, that was the thing I, I, we were trying to make a space that was flexible and, you know, because of the range of scale of contemporary art, you know, you could have a truck in here. They could take the window wall out and put something from inside to outside, you know, if you had the money. <laughs> right? Just think what he could do in one This is not a yeah. sell yeah, tonight, yeah, yeah, by yeah. the way. So the <laughs> I can sell, though. Right? <laughs> yeah, I can, he needs all that. So, but, um, so, there, you know, there, there was a... I mean, we made the spaces large to anticipate that, and also to anticipate their subdivision. But in that, and, it, and we were talking about this earlier, and it's actually one of the main topics of the whole book, this idea of occupation is, you know, holding your own ground in a way that says this, this is the domain of the architecture, yeah. right? And this is what the architecture is capable of doing, capable of revealing, ideally revealing something, capable of, of interpreting and, and communicating, and yet it's not complete in that way, right? It, 
it's, it's sort of setting up a frame for other experience, right? And so whether it's community experience or some other building typology, but this one, it is all about the art. And, and, and you'll see, you know, some of the shows, you know, they need another wall to make the scale right because the work's small. I mean, it's, it's, it's a learned, because it's an open, it's incomplete in that way, right? One, he has to spend money to build walls, which, you know, museums do. But you also have to learn the right scale for the right pieces, I think. Right. And I think that's incredibly appropriate for an, an institution that's non-collecting, right? We don't have a warehouse full of stuff where we know what the sizes are, you know? With each show, we have artists come visit. We're going through this together to see what we can create. And the artist dictates to us what we need to do with the space. Yeah. And the Ajay building, you have these eight rooms where it's fixed. And yeah. you find the work that fits in there. You don't create the work that finishes out the room. And we're very lucky that Jill Downen is here tonight, who um, was able to use the architecture of the building. <laughs> so maybe later on tonight, you can talk yeah, about yeah. your experience. Yeah. And, exactly. you know. Please. No, it's, it's interesting, the Bregenz Museum, which is a Peter Zumthor building, gorgeous, gorgeous building in Austria, right across the border from Switzerland. Um, each floor is one room, and they do not divide it. At least I've never seen it in all the catalogs and all the visits I've had. You know, they, 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 the architecture dictates the curation. And so if, it, if it's a painting, you know, it'd be like paintings on these walls, you know, big giant room with just paintings around the edges or an enormous installation. So sometimes the space works, sometimes it doesn't, but the architecture is sacrosanct. And I think it's a shame, actually. But it, it makes for an interesting, I mean, the contrast of the dialogue is really interesting. I mean, it's, it, it's come up before in discussion, too, and I think it's extremely rare in architecture, certainly in this country. Most of the commission, you know, my, my projects are primarily cultural buildings, right? And most of the, uh, most cultural buildings, if, if you just look around, and certainly a question to everyone here, are, it's an act of collection. It's like, I want one of those, right? So I'll, you know, whoever the architect is, however good or bad you think they may be, the community gets together, decides on the image they want, the image they want to communicate, the image they want in their city, and they buy one of those and put them in their city. And sometimes it fits, sometimes it doesn't, but it, you know. I think in some ways, if people are, are consuming architecture that way, it doesn't matter, they, you know. It, it's a product. And then I think there's the rare communities, and it's extremely rare, that actually commission architecture. And, it, and, and that's an entirely different thing. And when, when they hired me, I didn't even have anything built yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think, White and Kenny wasn't done when I got hired. I don't know what in the hell people were thinking. But they, they hired a kind of unknown and a, and a process and a, and, a, and a relationship and a, and a way of communicating and thinking. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's a commissioned piece of, you know. I mean, the Pulitzer is definitely a collected piece of architecture and a gorgeous one, and this is a commissioned piece. And I think that's, the nice, that's a nice way to think about the contrast of these two. And everything we do in art is about conversation. It's about feeling each other out. And I think the board of directors had the foresight through conversation could figure you out in a way that, you know, it's also the, the user yeah. being responsible for the building, right? Yeah, so the architect right. gives the building, provides the space, and then the user can feel they have the permission the, or they don't have the permission to do what mm -hmm. they want to do. Mm -hmm. So we felt, and I, I'm sure the board of directors felt when they were speaking to you, that they they were given permission. They had mm -hmm. the freedom, actually. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to ask the permission. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when we wanted to knock down those two, you know, two walls you had built at mm -hmm. the first show, we didn't felt like calling you because we knew that you would be happy mm -hmm. for us to knock it down and put something else up. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's also an, an open conversation. And then, and then the artist, mm -hmm. the, that's a third conversation coming and saying, well, I want to do this. And I want you to knock that down and put this up. Because I think that's what makes the show. I have to read this, this quote that I have in the first, the first essay in the book. Um, it has a, a lot, well, it has kind of everything to do with my work. Um, I'll, I'll read it. So, the essence of rhythm is the preparation for a new event by the ending of the previous one. Everything that prepares a future creates rhythm. Everything that begets or intensifies expectation. 
and it's a it's an art historian Susan K Langer from the 50s and and you can take that physically as a kind of as a structural rhythm or a, a movement through space rhythm but you can also take it as a as a rhythm of various forms of practice and occupation right that this building began something that then then resonates with a kind of life of its own that right. way and, and I think to me that's that's the most exciting part about architecture is that you do everything you can to intensify some experience you know to, to, to concentrate a sense of a place and a possibility and then let it go and and, and I mean you know, you're, you're doing things in the most in the most permanent you know with the most permanent materials you know expensive processes a lot of community effort you know and you and you manifest these things but to have them be static is almost the biggest tragedy tragedy you know to have them be something that's sort of there I mean it, it's it's fine you know the, the, the Chrysler building is a marker of time and it becomes a symbol and those things and the, and there's there's nothing there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but it's just to, to me personally that you initiate a dialogue Right? And you sort of frame that dialogue as the most exciting part of architecture. And I think it's actually what architecture does best. Right. It doesn't complete the dialogue, you know, but, it, but it, it sets it in motion and it sets it up in some way. Yeah, and the, the permanence is the building. The permanence is it's a, it's a stage set in a way. And as an institution, we are only alive when we're transient. It's the, it's the changing of the exhibitions, it's, the, it's the, the newness that gives life to this institution. And if we're static in any way, like this building provides the permanence and, and security, then we die. So it's the, it's, the, it's the change that actually gives us life in this institution. Thinking about the scale question a second ago, I think classical architecture, um, helped us understand its size through the relationship of the size of the parts to our own bodies. So the capital, the column, the entablature, and yeah. the stacking up of those parts. When a space has ambiguous boundaries and sort of materials that can dissolve and um, the kinds of uh, opportunities that these spaces afford, I'm wondering about for the art, Mm -hmm. My sense is that it allows the art to be understood at multiple scales or different scales. And I don't know if that's a challenge for the artists or how they approach that. Mm -hmm. well, I, I, I think Chelsea changed all that in that just before Chelsea, it was East Village. And in the East Village, everything was, you know, small, living room size. And then when these uh, taxi garages started opening up as galleries and you had these gigantic ceilings, you, you didn't know what to do with it. So even a giant painting, which would be nine by nine feet, still looked like a poster stamp. So artists had to deal with that. And, that, and Chelsea's been around for 20 years now, and so artists are very, very adept at filling spaces. And if you go to any artist studio, you're not going to find their studio as big as a gallery. Their studios are usually tiny, eight by 12 feet, and somehow in that space they create something that can fill you know, a 30 by 30 foot space. So artists, I think, for survival, they've learned to deal with dealing with scale. I was just thinking, though, that in relationship to the experience, what Brad was talking about, about having those kinds of experiences that change, I think it's a positive thing that, that, that the experience of the art has that multiple dimension to it. And I'm wondering if it's because of the relationship to the building. You were talking about the difficulty of trying to predict that or imagine it. Mm -hmm. So relative to the design process, how do you draw that? How do you, how do you anticipate that to happen in a project that yet doesn't exist? Well, it's, it's, it's actually one of the most interesting questions for me. Um, I remember Blair Kamen, who's a great architecture critic from Chicago, talked about this was the smallest monumental building he'd ever seen. So sure, that's really good. <laughs> no, it got me because I knew he was exactly right. That's um, good. That's oh good. man, it was, it's one of those times when you read criticism and you just go, oh, <laughs> absolutely nothing to say. You know, and, and, and where you stop, you know, we, we changed ceiling height some, mm -hmm. right? Maybe we could have taken the whole thing down three feet. I mean, it's an interesting issue because you're trying to create a frame that'll fit a lot of different things. But still, and still a possibility, but still not, you know, when it's filled with small pieces, 
you, you know, there's a home for you. It's, it's great you bring up the classical architecture because we talk about that so much relative to museums because if you go to the, the old National Gallery, what is that, the West Wing? Mm -hmm. well, the old, it's such a beautiful building actually. You know, filled with natural light, all those things that, that we like to do. But there's the vaults and the friezes and the moldings and all of the coves and things that bring the scale down and then these enormous gilt frames around a painting that's like that. I mean, if you look <laughs> at the size of those rooms and to the art, without all of that scale bridging of, of the decorative elements, I mean, they're really there to bridge mm -hmm. the scale. Yeah, that's what right. they are. I mean, those, and the good architects that were trained in that tradition really knew what they were doing. And so the Clifford Steel Museum this is really interesting for what Paul was saying as well. As Clifford Steele Museum, there was a, his will dictated 12 foot high walls. And if you look at the gallery, it says a Barbara, what was the old Barbara, what was the old gallery? I can't remember the name of the old Goodman, is that what it is? I can't Marian remember. Marion Goodman? Marion Goodman, yeah, but I don't know no. if that was the right. Anyway, if you look at the pictures of, of some of his early shows, in these big paintings and all a lot, of, and they were, you know, Barnett Newman and Rothko and whoever else was in these shows, the walls were 10 feet high in these enormous paintings, right? And Paul and I would never do that today. I mean, the, the standard height for a contemporary art museum is like 16 feet, and that's kind of, you know, minimum in some ways, right? Yeah, yeah. But these things were painted in rooms that were smaller than that and then shown in rooms and then sold to people's homes who never had walls taller than 10 or 12 feet. And yet today we make these enormous spaces. And so doing the Clifford Still Museum, it's really been an interesting thing. And so we've, we've set a couple of scale markers, you know, learning from, frankly, the West, the West Gallery. You know, not with molding, not with anything else. But we, we tried to do it with this line here. That's what this mm -hmm. structural break is, that that thing sets an intermediate scale. You know, for, for better or worse, that was what we were trying to do. So it's a huge volume, but it has a line. It's, it's really interesting, really, really interesting. But also in contrast to some museums, mm -hmm. it has a sense of structural legibility. You know, that wall holds up that wall. And uh, to me, that, that allows the space to feel familiar and yet may not, may not look necessarily like the space we've seen before. Mm -hmm. But somehow it feels familiar because we can understand how it stands up and how that piece of the building is supported. The fact that it's sitting on that wall and not just flush with it. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Big spans. Really, really big spans. Yeah. So the conception of this building is really two ribbons of concrete. I don't know. If yeah, know do that. talk about that. Well, it, it's, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was an order of concrete that goes perpendicular to that spring, right? Mm -hmm. Perpendicular to spring and gets broken for pedestrian passage and it it sort of dictates the movement of space through the building. And then perpendicular to that was the, the spanning elements that, I mean, the, just, just that juxtaposition of the two directions began to render the space more ambiguous, where something either slips under, or flows over, and out then with the shifts between the ceilings themselves. But it's just those two juxtaposed orders, really elemental, and, and setting up a width of galleries you know, a kind of rhythm of galleries, one being an outdoor gallery, mm -hmm. and then the two indoor bays. So that, that kind of three-dimensional structural matrix was there as the first act, again, for, excuse me, for later, later possible subdivisions. Mm -hmm. But that's it, those two, two rhythms, where the, the top rhythm is actually pretty much, pretty much intact, actually. I think the elegance is the simplicity of the building. You know, you, you can really feel the movement and the fact that there's basically three materials being used of the entire thing. And you, if you think about your experience in visiting a building, it's just so much stuff. There's a lot of stuff, There's you know? There's a lot of stuff. And here it's just so elegant. I, I, I think, you know, we go through physically so many bad buildings that when you're in a good one, you don't, re it's hard to realize it. But I, I thought it was interesting, uh, Brad's comment about the height. I mean, imagine if this was three feet lower it would have a completely different feel to it. We would, we would be ducking down as we sat down, you know, whereas now we can sit up high. I mean, it, it's just... Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Yeah. It's fun to come back, come back, and, come back and see it. <clears throat> you, you made an interesting point about commissioned architecture versus what was the other one? Collected. Collected. Have you found it, as, as you've become more 
successful and prominent? Have you found that that you had to think about that in the projects that you do or that you go after? And has that that's a really good changed question. over you're, your you're, you're uh, you're, the last few years? You're turning this on me, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, every day is a bright and shiny new day. Um, <laughs> um, well, of course, you start to build a body of work. I mean. For me, just seeing that book, and for all of us in the office, and that have worked on all those projects, it, you suddenly realize that you work for a few years and you have a body of work, and that then there starts to be similarities in some of the some of the language of space making and a little bit in form making. But I, but I think our work is so still pretty varied compared to a lot of people's work, and it's not varied because I just feel like doing new things. It's varied because each problem is so distinct. I, th I think part of what, uh, I don't know how to say this without, I, I guess I'll just make it per personal then. Part, part of what I desire um, is more specificity in the world, right? The sort of ubiquitousness. I was in London giving a talk and there was the pret manger and all the things that are in New York kind of taking over every city in America now. So if you just go to the airport in the cab, go down the street, you see the same stuff now in every city. I mean, it's just kind of terrifying. And, and then a lot of times in the building industry, it's the same materials and the same window details that you find here in Paris and Beirut or wherever it is. And yes, let's all embrace globalism and how wonderful it is and <laughs> things like that. Um, but you can still make things specific to a place. And I, and I think by doing that, you provide, and I, I think this is the responsibility that I feel architecture has, or certainly my work has, you provide some kind of reference that says, you know, this is here and that is there, right? And it can be a common language of architecture, certainly participate in a global discussion of architecture, but because that building is built here in St. Louis or there in Calgary, Alberta, or there in New York, it could only exist there, and that, uh, I think that's the goal for me, right? It, it can certainly have common, common conversations with my other work, with other people's work, and obviously there's only so many materials in the world, um, but it should feel like it can exist absolutely no, no place else. Because yeah. we need that specificity. It, it, it's interesting, Anne Hamilton made some comment about her feeling that her work, part of the responsibility or charge of her work is to, is to distinguish between technological space, which our life is filled with, right, and visceral space. And those of us who are makers still have the opportunity, although we all use technological tools, right, to great advantage, but to make visceral experience, and that visceral experience that you don't get anywhere else. And I, th I think that's so, it's such a profound recognition of the responsibility of architecture and, and great opportunity to, to, to do that. But it requires the walk. You know, it requires when you go to a place, yeah. you have to actually look at it. Right. Right? But I think, I think you're in the minority in thinking this way in that I think most people have a strategy where people are more comfortable when they're more familiar with things. Huh. So yeah. you know, yeah. airports, hotels, uh, business, you know, uh, rooms and things like that. They want it, Starbucks. So mm -hmm. wherever you are, you're comfortable because you recognize it. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it's a little bit of home when you're away. But mm -hmm. I mean, I, I completely agree with you in that, I mean, in our business and, and at museum, we're part of a larger dialogue. So we're pushing this language of contemporary art together collectively with all the other contemporary art museums around the world. And yet we have to somehow set ourselves apart from everyone so that we can stand out and to be recognized, right? So you're doing it all together and yet you have to somehow be a little different or a little better or a little, and in a way, I think with architecture, you know. It's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, our, we do live in such a commercial culture and it does take courage to do something different. And, in, you know, with a museum board and you're gonna spend $250 million on a major art museum, you, you know, they're probably not going to hire someone who's never built a building. I mean, it maybe makes a lot of sense, probably, probably makes a heck of a lot of sense. You know, but, but more times than not, they'll say, well, you know, Buffalo's got one or wherever. We'll just get a version of that because it's got good reviews and people like it and respect it and those, that person's important. And so they go on with their business. But so then you get six different cities with 
the same, I mean, not the same, but... Yeah, I, I just came up with a theory, and, and don't record me, Alex. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. So I think the, the same people who are comforted in going to Starbucks, so let's, say, let's say the it's board members, nature. are the same board members who say, I want a Frank Gehry. <laughs> it's, it's human nature. It's a paradox. Yeah, it is, a, it it is, is human, human nature. nature. There's this, this yeah. Heinrich Boll book that I read a million years ago, Billiards at Half Past Nine, and it was about an architect. And he had this ritual of wearing the same clothes, going to the same cafe every morning, having the same breakfast. Life's so much easier that way, <laughs> you know? I envy that, actually, in a lot of ways. <laughs> the, sounds, the, paradox, sounds... the paradox is that, that then those things lose their significance. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges of contemporary life, if I could be so bold as to suggest, yeah. one might be is knowing where you are. And I, don't, I think yeah, buildings help statement. you know where you are in ways that are, that's one of the fundamental ways you know where you are. And so my kind of dumb thing of how I think about that is that form follows the weather when it comes to buildings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or at least has some relationship to the physical place. Uh -huh. Yeah. It, it's interesting. See, I didn't know that's what you meant by specificity. Because, yeah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, it can be specific to a lot of things. If, if you're doing a, a, a museum for 17th century art, that's a specific thing too, and you make it serve that art, so it can be as internal and as functional. But, but I think it more it's it's if you say the building, the building. Again, there's 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 so many different models of architecture. There's models of architecture that says, and again, I think this is a prevalent one today. I'm going to build a building which is a model of my ideas, right? And in the case of a lot of architects, they're brilliant. The ideas are interesting. The buildings are engaging. And they do a series of work and a body of work over their lifetimes with a, with, with a conversation of, of ideas in full-scale model form across the globe. And again, I think that's the prevalent way of making architecture, and it's existed in, in history. I mean, you know, it's, it's not a new way of, of thinking about architecture. But, the, but then there are those ways that said that you come to a site and you say what, or you come to a city, or you come to an institution, and you say what can the architecture reveal that, that nothing else can reveal, right? That the art can't reveal, that the landscape architecture can't reveal, that, you know, is there something that the building can become that kind of le lens of reference? I mean, you said something about locating us or helping us know where we are. And I, and I think that sense of providing reference, mm -hmm. both to the world of ideas, right? Mm -hmm. right. But, it, you know, it, it's interesting. What's, I mean, art's mm -hmm. main purpose is to give us reference in the world of ideas be so bold, right? Right? It's, it's context is the world of ideas. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's site-specific art, and there's site that's responsive, and community-specific art, and all those other things, but it, it, it deals in the world of ideas and can propose physical relationships. Buildings are always physical. That's, that's, that's not even a question of buildings. They are physical. They begin with a physical dialogue, and they begin with their relationship to the city and our bodies, right? And it just feels like that beginning or, the, or, the, or that the primacy of that is not very common right now in the language of architecture. I think it's more common in, in art practice and in artist practice. I mean, it was so interesting to see people, you know, Doug Aiken, Ben Rubin, Anne Hamilton, very different artists, all talk about the importance of the body and the relationship of the body to the work right. and the kind of physical and visceral thing. And, and it, architects don't talk about that. And to be specific, you know, if you take it on a macro level, and with the birth of industrialization, if Skyline became everything, right? So yeah. what if the Seattle needle was everywhere, right? Then Seattle would not be special. What if the arch was everywhere? Then it would not, so it right. being where you are, you know, is very much dictated by what you're seeing, what you're, what, what you're experiencing. So it's interesting how if people were to think in that way, they would say, well, I don't want that other building that the other person has, right? Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because the role of the symbol is so crucial, whether it's the Chrysler building or the arch or anything else. But, but having them be representative of a specific aspiration, specific technological moment, right, and, and, a, and a specific place, is everything. And you know, New York City is about skyline, it is about objects. I, 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 for years, I didn't even know that the Empire State Building was up there. 
I knew the building at 34th and Madison or whatever it is, 34th and 5th, right? I knew the bottom of it and it looked kind of, you know, Art Deco. It was nice, nice base of the building. And oh my God, one day I looked up and I put the two together. That is literally true. <laughs> I had no connection between those two things at all. Because, you know, you're in the city, you're sort of going about your business. One thing I've wondered about is how the process of construction has become such that the way in which a building had the ability to demonstrate the process by which it was made has been lost. Mm -hmm. And to me, it is a, the distinction between construction and building. And uh, yeah. thinking of construction as maybe the commodification of a process that used mm -hmm. to have a great deal of significance. It used to be a measure of pride and progress. The building of the Empire State Building yeah. was a tremendous accomplishment. And uh, I wonder how or if we can recapture the way in which that part of the process uh, contributes to the significance of the, of, the, of the building and continues to do that. It's interesting. I, th I think it's coming, it's coming back. I, th I think, you know, for, for the sort of period of late modernism, probably, well, all the way through the 90s, or into the 90s, um, late modernism as far as the, the, the industry of production and commodity, I, I think it's swinging back where people care more about making and people at every level, people at the manufacturing level, there's a lot more custom manufacturing now yeah. than there was when my career started. But much, much you're more. You're very good about experimenting and, and I know Zayner who made these panels here, they're very proud of the work that they've done for the museum and Museum of Arts and Design used a, a, a an incredibly beautiful and interesting material for a building that people n wouldn't normally think to use. And well, it's, it's interesting when the, well, the, 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 this for instance is that we worked with Zaner because we knew, I mean, it, literally at that time again, 10, 12 years ago, this, this, when we started this project, there weren't that many people in the U.S. that actually would do custom fabrication. And so they found a loom in Chicago. There was one loom that was big enough you know, mesh panels are woven on a loom. That's one of those things to even just realize that. How fantastic is that, right? I mean, of course, they're fabric. They're, they're textile. So they found one loom that was big enough, and they contracted with that loom to make the panels. And, you know, we talked to them about how big it was and how big it could be and all of that. And that just, just to, to be engaged with someone at a manufacturing or a construction level where it's a conversation. But it, it happens in all of our projects now. Yeah. And it doesn't cost that much more. I think there is an assumption it does cost more. But like the Museum of Arts and Design, we worked for two years starting with a ceramic artist who restores building glazes to this 500-year-old porcelain company, Royal Tischler, and developed an iridescent glaze that never existed on buildings before. And we had the license to do that from the client because, you know, originally the craft museum and, and they were certainly interested in the possibilities of that. Um, it cost $250,000 more on a building that's, you know, $40, $50 million. So, I mean, the relative impact is so small. And I think people are starting to value that. You know, having not seen it for years, I think they're starting to value that, the, you know, what you get for your return on something like that is... is is really priceless, and to find people to do it. But that, that's what's so interesting. I mean, and I do think it's changing in the United States, but the curtain wall manufacturer was Sila, which is in, outside of Munich, that do those glass cubes that Apple did on, you know, across from the mm -hmm. plaza, right? Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful. I mean, their, their shop is, is cleaner than this museum, I'll tell you. I mean, it's absolutely amazing, right? But so you, you have a curtain wall manufacturer in Germany, and a 500-year-old porcelain company in the Netherlands, and you assemble it in New York, and it was still cheaper than the U.S. Yeah. any of the U.S. fabricators yeah. would do, yeah. right? And I think that's pushing the U.S. Yeah. to now change. That they, the, the, as those markets get more global, <laughs> right? The U.S. can't just do the same stuff that they've been doing. I mean, you buy the same window details that you could have bought in 1958, right? I mean, there's something perhaps endearing about that, but I mean, a little bit of change might be good, you know? <laughs> but it worked for them, you know, and they have these huge marketing machines and they sell this thing by zillions of lineal feet of window. 
Start. Should we open it up to some questions now? Questions? You know, I saw a couple of the first shows. It's been so long. You know, it, it was awkward. They, you know, they, they didn't have any money left to build walls. You know, they sort of took everything they could just to get it built, right? And rightfully so. And then they had to begin installing art. So, you know, the, the first shows, I think, were sort of unsettled um, in that way. And when I came in, well, I came in a couple years ago, and it felt better. And when I came in today, I didn't want to, I didn't go up and see him right away. I wanted to wander around. And it just felt alive. It just feels great. We were talking about this wall was supposed to have been built in two sections on, on rollers. So it could either have an opening in the middle or openings on the end. And so that's essentially what we designed. You know, because it needs that division between the space for events like this, right? So just to begin to see it have the different lives, it's fantastic. I love the color that it takes your eye up there. No, it, it's 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 exciting to see, you know. Just to me, and I, I don't I don't I don't know how other architects feel that way because I think a lot of t uh, architects are more, are more precious with their work. And then I, I'm sure I could come in here and see stuff I hate, but so what, you know? Because the body of the building is not going to change, right? I mean, well, I don't know. You could spray paint the mesh or something, but I don't. I don't. I don't and I, and I'll, I'll fully admit that we don't know what we're doing here yet. You know, and I feel like, you know, like when you're filling out those quest online questionnaires, they'll say like you're five percent there, you're twenty percent there. I feel like we're about twenty percent there in terms of figuring out how to use this space, and and I think that's because it is so flexible, and you know, the more possibilities you have, the harder it is to pinpoint that what you should be doing. So. I mean, this is a new house for us, and we're still trying to figure out, should that be the living room, should that be the den, you know? <laughs> so we're still moving boxes around in this, in this house. You no, know, it's, it's like the, the building tried to interpret what it could from the city and the site, and now it, it you know, it, it's, it has another life, you know? It's, it's, it's the art and, and the curators are, are interpreting the building relative to that. And it's, that's, I mean, the, that the architecture, I love the fact that architecture is so permanent, but it gives life, ideally, to something that is absolutely unimaginable, right? I mean, that's what makes it meaningful to me. Any other questions? Yes. Somebody had a question. Mass Mocha? Yeah, I mean, the reason that was built was, uh, the story has it, that the, uh, the director was flying in his plane, <laughs> saw this huge thing, you know, and said, we can use that to uh, bring economy into this uh, North Adams area. And they've absolutely completed uh, what they set out to do, in that um, there was some study done, and it was a uh, thing where they said, you know, if there was only two institutions, then we wouldn't have the vibrancy. But by adding a third, that creates the critical mass. And so in a way, this also is an example of where you have one doesn't complete, but with together, you create this energy. And so, you know, Mass Mocha has absolutely done what they set out to do. It's, it's a huge space to fill each month, but somehow they do it. And it's, and, and 
because it's unique and it's because it's so large, you see exhibitions there that you couldn't see anywhere else. And that's a draw. It, it's an interesting question. I mean, it, it applies to all cultural institutions, but I think you think of the Dia and Mass Mocha. Who are those buildings for? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I was talking to someone just the other day. Was it 22nd Street where the old deal was? Mm -hmm. I think that's yeah. where it was. And what a shame that it's not there. I mean, it's kind of heartbreaking, right? And there were, you know, internal reasons and economic reasons and God knows what else. And the building up there is gorgeous, just like Mass Mocha is gorgeous. Um, and it's the same thing. Look at the scale of the art, and it's just awe-inspiring. But it, who's it for, you know? I mean, it just raises a really interesting question, and you could, we could go through a whole discussion of other mm -hmm. sites and cities and buildings about, uh, and, and as long as it's a self-aware, you know, as long as it's a self-aware decision that this is a destination place, that you can go there on a Wednesday in the winter and there's going to be two people in there, right. and it costs like, I don't know how much money a day, right, I mean, I don't know. I mean, not not that those matter, but I mean you gotta you gotta at least know that and say that's that's fine. Yeah, right? yeah I, I never thought of it that way, but it's it's not for the locals, right? No, it's not for it's not for the locals, and yet the people it primarily serves are you know hundred miles away. Or, right. All the board of directors are hundred miles away. I don't know. It's it's an interesting issue. I think I, I, I I'm you know you go there and it's fantastic, but I'm kind of on the fence about it. I don't really. You know, why couldn't it have been just across the river in one of those beautiful old things that have been torn down since mm -hmm. in Newark or something? I mean, yeah. Right, right. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? <coughs> it's interesting. Yeah, a collection, yeah. to a found building. And I guess I would add, do you mm -hmm. think about that when you're Oh, thinking? yeah. Yeah. And we thought about it here. We thought about it here because, you know, I mean, Paul said it so well, you know, where is most art made, contemporary art, in the last 40, 50 years is big old warehouses. And then they started showing it in the big old warehouses, right? And what is it about an old warehouse that is conducive to that? Is it the juxtaposition between old and new? old building new art, I do think there is some of that. It kind of heightens the dialogue. And so when we were thinking about this building, it was, you know, make a space that has the possibility of a big building, a big span, that's raw enough, and maybe this building's too refined even, right? But that's raw enough in some way that it, that, that work can counterpose it in, in, in some, you know, from a material or a presence kind of way. We, we have those discussions a lot, because mm -hmm. if a building's too precious, you know, the materials are too precious or it's too considered, it can become a constraint in and of itself. Like, I, I think in some ways the Bregenz Museum in Austria does, does that. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's interesting, the, the Clifford Still Museum, it's for the collection, we know exactly what's going in there. And nothing else will ever go in there. It's one artist's work. And there's a range of the work, right, and of scales and history, there's chronology, but it is a fixed mm. entity. So it's actually a different dialogue than what we were having earlier about this building, right? It's, 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 so what we've tried to do with that is, and this we actually learned from the Manil, the, the original Manil building, um, is to create a range of light so it's, it's 
the light then changes your experience with the art. Mm. I mean, tr so there's, I mean, there's there's a bunch of different things. There's there's a spatial complexity to that building, where even though the rooms are very set, there's a sense of labyrinth, and you can kind of get lost in there, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. It creates a sense of mystery, and then the quality of the light. All of the painting galleries, not the drawing galleries, but the painting galleries are all filled with natural light. And if you go to the Twombly too, that's what's so. The Twombly is a great case relative to the to the to the still building. Those paintings never change, mm -hmm. and yet you go in there and it's spectacular. You go in there at dusk and the yellow just jumps off the, you know, a color you never really noticed. Just yeah, like every time it knocks you down. Yeah, it just knocks you out, and the stills are so powerful that way that I that we hope that you go there for that kind of contemplation of things maybe beyond including but also beyond the art but it's a it's a it's fun to have those challenges because they are so so distinct in that way right 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 I would consider that a tremendous failure I would literally be heartbroken if that happened. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but it's 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 interesting. But I, you know, I th I think, you know, it goes back to the, the when that people first started questioning the white box in the '70s. Mm -hmm. You know, the blank white box. Is there a neutral art space? Well, no. There's no such thing as a neutral art space. So how much charge does the building? Give I, what I used to say about the building, this building, in the very beginning, is that its responsibility, and it's probably true of any museum, is to set up a sense of anticipation. Right, that there's something going on here that that you don't know about. Right, that there's something. You know, that, that you either prepare them, well, you prepare them experientially for for something new, and then new could be 18th century landscapes. Right. But it, it doesn't matter that that's something that's not in your everyday life, and that mm -hmm. somehow engaging the building kind of opens you up in some way to that experience. That would be the ideal. And sometimes, you know, a, a really gorgeous neoclassical building does the same thing. The kind of sense of wonder and place in history, you know. And then you see an amazing piece of contemporary art in it. Right. It's it's odd though that in the last twenty years, modern art has been so um, prevalent in these neo-industrial buildings and building types. Yeah. I, I actually think it's kind of a penance for the industrial revolution. We're trying to heal our <laughs> psyche with art. Yeah, that's probably true. With people ma you know, making things and smearing things rather than machines stamping out metal. That's interesting. Did you have any unique challenges with the art and design building in New York? <laughs> Besides, besides New York and besides, the, besides and everything, the, the picketing. Yeah, besides everything. Yeah, um, unique challenges to the building. You know, once you take the politics aside, which we didn't really have anything to do with that. That was all going long before the, the charge we had for that project. The, in selling the building to the Museum of Arts and Design, they had to change the facade, but they couldn't change the size because the, the Time Warner building, the parapet had been set by the height of that building. So, so to me, I took that building as the site. It's a concrete box, a kind of closed concrete box. And so it, that's the material site and the structural site. And then the collection, being a lot of wood, metal, glass, ceramic, can take a lot of natural light. So we use the force of the collection to kind of break the building apart and open it up to light. And so. It was just the it was the challenge of that particular sort of solid block of concrete and how one opens it back up to the city and the amazing views that it has. So it was, it was mostly that. I mean, just the, the body itself, mm -hmm. and it's a tiny building. So we struggled for a long time with kind of big gestures, you know, like mm -hmm. architects like to do, and then you wouldn't be able to put any art in it. So that little two foot cut. I mean, we just did one thing in the end, and it kind of re-rendered the whole space, which, that was a great lesson. I learned a lot from that. I mean, we didn't add anything to that building, we just took things away. And that's a great... Philip? Last summer, I had a chance to visit the expansion we did at Van Arnold, which is the first edition museum of art, which I thought was a very handsome building, both from the architect's point of view, but also the way it was installed with the collection.
That's a great question. So the University of Michigan Art Museum is in the historic center of the University of Michigan and filled with neoclassical buildings and then pseudo neoclassical buildings of the last 10 or 15 years and there was no contemporary architecture. Two building sites left and this, this is the one on the Diag that tens of thousands of students go by. So we were filling one of the last open sites you know, with a piece of contemporary architecture. So it was, it was a pretty intense, a lot of very excited people in the community and a lot of faculty very excited. I remember one woman in one of the public hearings got up and said, it's a gorgeous design if it was a North Campus. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, then, and then the dean, Doug Kelbaugh at the time, got up and said, he gave the most eloquent speech. I mean, very short. But his eloquent response was something, not, not quite as dumb as I'm about to say it, but it was, you know, University of Michigan is a research institution. They, they do absolutely, you know, they, they cultivate new thinking in every discipline and yet you're not going to do that in architecture. And it just closed the debate. <laughs> it, was, it was absolutely brilliant. You know, but for some reason, we can't do that in architecture. You know? I've tried that at Wash U. We haven't been able to. It's not working out well. Maybe you can say it backwards. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking that I drove by on the way uh, in. I need your help. Boy, oh boy. <laughs> That's a tough one. <laughs> Definitely a tough one. But um, so what we did on the site was we lifted the building up. There's enormous cantilevers. We tried to make, well you can, you can walk under and through the building. So, in so the, and the site is all public, there's no security. So you can move, the students could kind of move through and under the cantilevers and see into that one gallery on the corner and then it would still have an openness, obviously filled with a piece of architecture, but have an openness that way. That was the one clear response. It's amazing, isn't it? And the yeah. Brick yeah. Masonic temple. The Masonic, Masonic temple. The Acropolis there. <laughs> Which is why it's, I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting. Like, I think that's, that's the wall of the, the, the furthest concrete wall is the wall. Of that's the post. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty amazing because they're, along with that, it's like the staging of walls up to mm -hmm. this, this incredible difference of these other buildings. I just wonder. Yeah, I, w I wish I could say I responded to that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably my more successful contemporaries would be taking that and running right now. Yeah, but, yeah. but but the extension of walls to the Pulitzer was certainly part of the discussion. But or just at, or at least um, just in general broadly how you thought about the diversity of the architecture. I I was mostly that's that's grand up there, right? Mm -hmm. I was mostly looking that way. And that, well, the front step yeah. For that. Well, and just just because that goes on forever, you know, or it did. I was in some other city. I think it was, I think it was in London when I was in London, and I was talking to some architects. And the, is that a burned-out cathedral or mm -hmm. the church yeah. still there? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that goes to my point, by the way. So, it was years ago that I was here. That amazing thing was there. This fellow had been here at some other time. And we were sitting down at dinner having this discussion, and we both talked about that. You guys, make sure that doesn't go away. It really, yeah, it should never go away. But I mean, that's you know, a place of memory that's not only just about the, the sort of urban history of the neighborhood, but now becoming a kind of place of memory for other things. And I know there's been art installations in it too, hasn't there? Been? Yeah. Yeah, amazing thing. I, I couldn't believe that, actually. It's a relatively recent, I think, phenomenon that we'd accept as a natural uh, phrase, the term urban landscape, uh, yeah. it, which is a beautiful thought about how landscape can, in a way, heal the city in different ways than we would have naturally expected relative to the mm -hmm. traditional ways that cities grow or, or decline or uh, how they change. To, to, to the two simple acts of, of 
it trying to bound the site again, but yet feel transparent. And that you'd feel like you were out there connected to those empty lawns and that in some ways it would just sort of roll through. Because you can, you know, when that window's open, and I'm not sure about the view with the wall where it is now, but in the beginning you could see Joe, you know, you could see from the corner, you could see the, the Sarah piece. And I, you know, it's, I wanted it to still feel like it was connected to, this, to that landscape. But even though we were now, you know, filling in that beautiful kind of urban prairie. Um, the, and also the, I mean, Brad showed his sensitivity in that he didn't simply plop down a rectangular building. You know, he could have easily just said, well, here's your building. Good luck with that. But yeah. he was sensitive to the curve of Spring Street. And, you know, a lot of people mm -hmm. visiting they don't realize it is a curved wall. But it, that, that absolutely says he was respectful of knowing where we are and how we're going to. It's, it's funny, in the beginning, we didn't. Because, you know, curved walls in museums sometimes get resistance. Yeah, not you know, good. There's that, there's that funny spiral building in New York. <laughs> right. <laughs> But so we did resist that, and it was <laughs> rectangular. And then it was—it just felt like it was such an artifice, because there's this little bit of leftover site. I mean, it was—it was, it was kind of silly <laughs> to, to not let the building follow it. And then it was so gradual that you can still hang, yeah. hang art on it. We lost a big museum project because we had walls curved about that much. Mm. I'm curious. That no way, curved so walls. Was no. Mm -mm. I know it wasn't built like the but it wasn't even, it wasn't even, yeah. Yeah. So there was a panoramic view. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. You mentioned about lessons learned and, and you know, the practice of architecture. You create these beautiful buildings and I get a time to step back and come back again. What lessons learned from this project would you share with us for thinking of the future work? What might you revisit mm -hmm. if you well, we've, I, I like Paul's observation earlier that I've learned that I would never work this hard on a building again. <laughs> <laughs> this building was so inexpensive, and it doesn't look inexpensive. And we just, myself and Kyle Loman and Chelsea and some people just, there's a lot of their soul in this thing. I think you can do that, you know, you can only do that so many times, I think. <laughs> It's hard. But no, I, the, the whole dialogue about scale, incompletion, you know, that, that, that sort of how much hand for what kind of art, how much control and lack of control started with this. And again, a lot of it was serendipity because we just couldn't build a lot. So in not building a lot, I suddenly was revealed to things that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. And then, you know, the, the language of this architecture, the two ribbons, this sort of ambiguity of structure that's very determined, you know, but yet kind of amazing, you know, with these huge spans and cantilevers and things. You know, a transparent concrete building is a normal expression. So I, I, a lot of the spatial understanding, you know, we've, we've taken further. I mean, you'll, you'll see a lot of the lessons in Clifford Still that began here, no question. We, we tried to get away from them, actually, but the building was about the same size, and then it got pretty cellular because of the art, and, and it was, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think that's what a body of work does. You, you, you learn, and then you continue the dialogue. Yeah. Yes. You talked about earlier how, um, in the 70s, we began to reconsider the notion of the white box as the background for contemporary art. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. um, how comfortable do you think with museum designers are with that what do you think is next? Well, what do I think is next? Huh. Well, I don't think it's a material question. I think it's just a spatial question. But there, there must be material questions. I mean, I've been in probably 20, not all of them, but probably yeah. 25 mm -hmm. contemporary art museums that have been built in the last 20 years. Uh -huh. And they really, all, many of them, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, the Ajay in Denver, dark wood. That's, I mean, that's prevalent. So that's really different. Sheet rock and glass. I mean, it's really yeah. kind of sheet rock and glass. The Ajay. I, I mean, there aren't that many. I mean, I'll, I'll just take a little step. 
you know, unless you have a thousand dollars a square foot, you, you the palette of building materials is kind of set. I mean, and that's okay because I think it's what you do with it. To to me, it's, I mean, the, the way we poured Clifford Still is interesting. I hope, right? We put a lot of research into that, um, but it's still concrete, right? And we chose concrete for Clifford Still because everything around it was shiny glass and. You know, I wanted something that would sit in the earth, so I chose concrete. And so, and so I, I just think it's whatever material makes sense. Too, it's not, it's not like if you gave me a lot more money. I mean, this building. I mean, I think what you're one of the things you might be intimating is there's a rawness associated with buildings for contemporary art. I think in the last 20 years, and that lends itself to concrete because we don't build with brick anymore. I just wonder how we're going to look at it over the years. Yeah. Yeah. I have a much higher esteem generally for most of the original buildings that those modern, yeah. modern buildings are attached to yeah. than the additions themselves, no matter how yeah. they might be. Yeah. Well, that's a whole different discussion too, though, then. See, that's an entirely different discussion. Yeah. It's, it's amazing what you I think having the Pulitzer next to us is a, a great example for architect students in that pretty much same material, pretty much same footprint, and yet emotionally they're completely different buildings. And so I think with um, very limited materials you have a lot of permutation that you can still draw from. And I don't, it's, I don't think it's been finished yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we're, we're making a building called the National Music Center of Canada, and we're using concrete but it's exposed on the inside, clad on the outside. But the forms are something we've never done before. And the space is amazing, absolutely amazing. But it's the same old, you know, it's got tile on the outside, concrete. I mean, it, it has yeah. that ribbon character, though, in some ways. It does. That's a different, it's yeah. beautiful. Right? Yeah, no, it's, it's a, a great project. Is it, yeah. what, 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 at what stage is it? CDs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's in the book, right? Yeah. In the book, yeah. Don't forget the book. <laughs> you have to believe in books. Yeah. The fact that this publisher made an architecture book That's like this unbelievable. is kind of unbelievable. Gotta gotta support that. Well, I want to thank you, Brad and, and Bruce, for and and you all for coming here tonight. And um, it's a lot of fun. So yeah. great to be back. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody.